You're listening to BBC Radio 2, celebrating the 50th anniversary of the birth of the light programme. Now we present a classic episode of the hugely popular daily radio serial chronicling the lives of Dr Dale and his family and friends, as told by his wife Mary in Mrs Dale's diary. It's New Year 1958 and Mrs Dale is looking back over the first ten years of her diary. In this episode, she reflects on the events of 1954 and 1955. And 1954's diary begins very cheerfully. I don't know what time Bob got in on New Year's Day from the Chelsea Arts Ball. It was only afterwards that we knew what had happened there. Bob, let go of my hand. I shall do no such thing. Jenny, I want to talk to you seriously. Very, very seriously. In fact, I've been saving up this very serious talk until tonight. The Albert Hall isn't the place to have a serious talk. It's exactly the place for this one. And this is exactly the music. I've always thought it would be rather impressive to propose to music. To propose to music? Well, don't pretend you didn't hear Mrs. Dale to be. What I said was to propose to music. Sally's name seems to come on almost every page of 1954. She found herself with a ward, Trevor, who was Stephen's nephew. And she had her own little shop now, Sarah, in Parkwood Hill. Here she sold her hats, assisted by Mother. In the little curtained room off the shop, they struggled with purchase tax. Here's April 23rd, St George's Day, and Sally telling Mother something quite casually. Where's the Book of the Words? Ah, notice by the Commissioners of Customs and Excise. Hats. And let's see. H. Headgear. Protective helmets designed for use by miners and quarrymen. Alec telephoned me last night again. He seems very keen on my getting in touch with this man, Denby Harris, that he knows. He says that anything Denby Harris touches turns to money. Mm, he must be a very fortunate man. Bags. Ah, now we do make them sometimes. Open bags exempt. Hmm. A bag must be one, not less than 12 inches and more than 18 inches in length, excluding gusset. If you don't put that down, I shall scream. But I love it dearly. Articles which, except for external fitments and except for bottoms of wood or other vegetable substance... Oh, we've never made a bag with a bottom of vegetable substance, have we? Alex says it would mean my being able to set up a shop in the West End. Mother, do listen. I refuse to listen to anything that has to do with Alec Dale in the way of business. How many more times was I to write the name of Denby Harris in my diary? How little I knew then what I'd write the following year. April, May, June. Bob mixed up with a girl called Angela Wade. Bob nearly marrying her out of pity because she'd been injured in a car accident. Jenny getting engaged to Clifford Pugh and both of them really loving the other all the time. Sally again. Was she really in love this time? The Marquis Raffaele de Fienza. And then in October, the opening of Stephanie. Frightful crush everywhere, isn't it? Yes, uh, there do seem to be a good many people here. Good luck to Stephanie. We're all her friends here. Let us introduce ourselves. Anthony Copper. My name is Defiant. Surely you'd be modest. Aren't you, uh, Raffaele of Rope? Yes, I am. Mrs. Lane hasn't mentioned my name to you? I have not known Mrs. Lane for long. I am Sally's ex-husband. There was, um, one after me. He was killed in an air accident. Yes, Mrs. Lane told me that. Uh, if you'll excuse me now. Excuse me, please. No, no, mind out. Where are you going? Uh, I beg so your pardon. Sorry. Oh, it was my fault. Mine, Mr. Fulton. My dear Fulton. You seem to know each other. You haven't forgotten me, I hope. Tony Coppard. <laughs> it's rather funny, eh, the three of us. You are being extremely objectionable, Mr. Coppard. Well, let me tell you, my fine friend, that it's very interesting for me to see Sally here in this grand scarlet and gold cellar. I knew her in the days when... Will you be quiet? But leave the place at once. At once. You will not cause a scene here. Won't I? You don't know me, do you? Tony Coppard. Haunting Sally's life all these years. What will be the end of it, I often wonder. 
1954, it seemed as if Stephanie was all made for success. 1955, a new diary. January here, and a New Year party up at King's Acre. Alec was very silent. And then on the 4th of January, the story of Denby Harris on the front page of every newspaper. This chap, Rubier, went to the police. It seems he wasn't satisfied with the way the affairs of Dunstable Limited were being run. Dunstable Limited being another of Denby's companies. Uh, one that you're connected with? Yes. Well, that started the hair. There was something wrong with the company's affairs. Badly wrong. Denby's finished. He hasn't a chance. He's a gambler and his gambles haven't come off. Alec, uh, in exactly what way are you involved with Denby Harris? I don't know. It, it sounds impossible, Jim, but I, I just don't know. I've gone around with Denby. I'm secretary to three of these companies of his. Three? Yes, but I didn't know what was going on. Denby's got a lot of associates, big business chaps. I, I left it all to them. I was just a name useful for signing things. I didn't follow all the talk that went on at company meetings. Oh, can't be such a fool as that, Alec. Well, what I followed, I took for granted. I, I didn't go looking into things. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to Denby. You can't do that. It's foolhardy. You can't help him now. No, but he's my friend. I'm sorry, Jim, but I'm going back to him. And what about us, Sally? Stephanie, I mean. How do we stand as directors of the company? Hmm? It's grim, Richard. It looks as if we shall have to close. It's what the experts advise. Of course, we're a separate company and not actually involved in the crash directly. But now all we have is an enormous overdraft, a collection of debts, mostly to builders and decorators and furniture people, and a fine property mortgaged up to the hilt. How much money would we need to start clear? Oh, darling, I don't know. Much, much more than you or I could ever find. I know what Fulton feels about you, Sally, and perhaps about me, but things are too grave at the moment for any of us to take personal views. Fulton must see me as soon as he can. I am prepared to take over, Stephanie. February and March and April, waiting for Alex's trial at the Old Bailey. Gossip and scandal all round us. It was beautiful on some of those spring days, but I don't seem to have put down much, even about the garden. Everything seemed to come at once. Mr. Owen refused to let Bob and Jenny marry. Dear old Boson died. And then Richard Fulton knocked down by a lorry. Mother, you rang the hospital again. He was still unconscious. Yes, I I'm afraid so, oh. but... Uh, oh, Sally, my dear. After all, it happened to me too, and I'm quite all right again. You must wait to hear from the hospital. I can't wait. I can't. Oh, Richard. Richard. In all the papers that you go every day to the hospital, I, I know how you feel, but soon our engagement must be made public. You've taken my answer for granted, then. But I asked you to wait for it until I had told Richard. And you did tell him? No. No, I, I was just going to tell him on that walk in the park when it happened. Raph, I must wait to see how he what is. What has that to do with it? What he means to me is something that I can't explain. If he means so much, the truth is that you are in love with him and not me. Now that this has happened, you, you must give me time. I will not wait. You must give me your answer here and now, finally. Then my answer is no. Put up Alexander Dale, Denby Harris, and Frederick Moore. <laughs> Alexander Dale, how do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Uh, Speak up. Not guilty. Mr. Dale, will you tell the jury what was the value of that stock in money? Several thousands. I, I can't exactly say. I have the figures here. Allow me to tell the court on your behalf. The sum involved was some hundred thousand pounds, a large sum, you will agree. And yet you say you do not remember the contents of the documents? I told you I, I, I didn't read the paper. You were holding a responsible position as company secretary, and yet you thought there was no need for you to read the papers you were signing. 
Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the prisoners stand indicted before you for having committed acts of fraud and also for conspiracy. Before I go any further, I wish to deal with the case against the prisoner Alexander Dave, a man who... Do you find the prisoner at the bar, Alexander Dale, guilty or not guilty of conspiracy to defraud? Not guilty. Do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty of fraudulently converting property to his own benefit? Guilty. The sentence of the court is that you, Alexander Dale, be imprisoned on the second count for six months. And so on these pages, the nightmare days go by. There were some happy days after that, though. Philip was born at Virginia Lodge. And that was a happy time. Other things, the Merediths coming, poor Albert Morgan dying, Harriet Lamont, Sally's new partner in Stephanie, Mr. Fulton recovering, and Jim's new trainee arriving. Do come in, Dr. Mitchell. You are a bit early, but... I'm usually late, so I thought I'd be on the safe side. Mother and I are just having a cup of tea. Do sit down and have some. I'd love some tea. I hope I haven't brought too much luggage. Oh, good oh, heavens. Yeah. What on earth oh. have I sat on? Dr. Mitchell, you have sat on Captain. Oh, I say, I, I'm terribly sorry. H have I hurt him? Hurt him? Broken a limb, most likely. But, Mother, he's running out of the room. Dr. Mitchell told me when he came for his interview with Jim that he didn't care for cats. Mrs. Freeman, please. However little I cared for cats, I wouldn't sit down purposely on your cat. Now, Mrs. Freeman, what can I do? Go out and buy him a chocolate mouse or something? Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. There is nothing that you can do. I will go out and find Captain and take him to the vet. 1955 had been such a sad year, but it would end in the nicest way it could, with Bob and Jenny's wedding. I seem to have got quite frantic on these pages for November, Wild notes and entries about the catering, the flowers, the invitations, clothes, guests, presents, all mixed up together. Everyone always talking at once. Do you know what's the matter with us? We've got ladies' fever. Ladies' fever? Temperatures breaking out about no gloves, no bag, no shoes, and nothing to wear. Oh, Lord, freedom going with every minute. You think I'll have to feed you day after day? Chop, steak, fish, sponge, pudding for years and years. I don't think I can face it after all. Love as hell, I know, even though I haven't reached the marrying stage yet. Seventy-one presents already. Jim, do wake up. Mary, don't be so bright. It's far too early. I'll have to give you a sleeping draught. Put you to sleep until after the wedding. Of course, I said I'd pay for the reception, but it's going to set me back a hundred pounds with a hundred people. But it was to be eighty at the most. Oh, it's become a hundred. Mrs. Smith must be asked. And Mr. Brown was so kind. And then Miss Robinson, who's a distant relative. <laughs> must have a new boiler for the wedding. Calm down, Mary, calm down. It doesn't matter a bit about the boiler. It does, it does. We must have hot water for the wedding. I could sit here all day and all night reading these pages. 1955, almost over. A strange mixture of despair and happiness. <laughs>